Welcome, friends, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast that dares to talk about setback and failure, but not so we can commiserate. It's so we can elevate. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our mission today is to offer you the hope that your crucible experiences, those traumas and tragedies and setbacks and failures you've experienced or are experiencing right now, don't define you. They refine you. They did not happen to you. They happened for you. And I don't know many people who know that better than the founder of Beyond the Crucible, the host of this podcast, and my friend, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, I'm a broken record by this time. I always say at this point (laughs) in the show, this is going to be a really good episode, another one packed full of information and insight for folks. So I'm looking forward to it, and I know you are as well. (laughs) Absolutely, Gary. I'm looking forward to it, too. And one of the reasons that we're both looking forward to it is, once again, we get to share the microphones and the cameras with our friend Cheryl Farr, who is uh, the founder and chief strategist for Signal Brand Innovation. Cheryl, welcome back again. Hi, Gary. Hi, Warwick. It's great to be here again. Folks, we are talking again um, still, uh, and, and that's in a good way, not in a bad way. We are still going through the uh, our statistically valid trials to triumphs self-assessment, which offers those who take it details of a personal journey that is bit like that is a bit like an endurance run. There are no sprints to the finish line or ways to cut the track. You've got to do the hard work of moving through each stage of the journey from your personal you are here mark on that map. And you have to do it at the speed that's right for you, what you've been through, and where you're going. Hear me when I say this. It's not a competition. Everyone has their own clock. So please, please, please feel no pressure to break the tape first. We've extended the running metaphor as an easy way to visualize the Trials to Triumph roadmap and to understand the six unique starting points. And this week, we're going to delve into the profile for On a Different Track. And Warwick, before I get us way off track by talking too much, I will turn it over to you to begin the questioning for this this insightful, I'm sure, episode that we're going to have. So thanks, Gary. Uh, And again, welcome, Cheryl. It's so uh, awesome to have you. And so when I think about on a different track, and I'm sure people are thinking the same thing, is what does being on a different track mean? Ah, that is a great question, (laughs) Warwick. So on a different track is the profile comprised of 28% of people who do not acknowledge that they've gone through a crucible moment. So they feel like they haven't really gone through an experience of a trauma or loss that has fundamentally changed the trajectory of their lives. So 72% of us say yes. So basically three in every four of us say yes, we've gone through at some point a trauma or loss that has fundamentally changed the trajectory of our lives whether that's a big one or a small one or a number of them, it doesn't matter. Three in four of us acknowledge. This is about the one in four of us who say, no, you know what? That's never really happened to us. Life has been kind of smooth sailing. Okay? That's the biggest characteristic, but it is not the only characteristic of the on the different track, on a different track profile. Um, They carry, interestingly, while they don't have any um, acknowledgement of a crucible, they do carry some anger or sadness about how things have gone in their lives. They've got a little bit, they say, ah, you know, things have been generally okay, but they have a little bit, they actually slightly disagree that they aren't angry about how things have gone in their lives. And one of the things we know is that when people slightly disagree, it means they slightly agree too, right? So (laughs) there is that sense of, you know, there's this residual, I've had it pretty good, but I wish things had been different kind of vibe. Um, Interestingly, a few other things about them is they have on vision, they have a somewhat high vision, right? They've got at least the seeds of a vision for how they life, like life to be. But they have a somewhat low reality score, meaning they're not sure what that should look like, how to act on it. 
And something that's really interesting is when we were talking about this profile, Gary said, boy, this is the one profile we had when we were reviewing this last week. It all is lukewarm, right? Somewhat, slightly, nothing is full throttle here, right? This is, um, there's no commitment in any direction. There's just a lot of moving along, things have been okay, but I still feel a gap. There's a little bit of, is this all there is? or there's something missing. Um, there's something missing, some way I'd like life to be different than it is today. That's how I would characterize on a different track. So Gary, uh, you talked about, you know, this is a profile of, as you said, lukewarm, slightly, maybe, perhaps, right? Like a lot of those kind of adjectives. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the, it's the only profile that we have where those words show up in such concentration, right? Somewhat high vision score, somewhat low uh, reality score. They slightly disagree about getting angry. Uh, they are. Uh, and, and that word just like popped into my head. It's, 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 it's not a full throttle experience that they're going through. They're, 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 um, they're hard to spot in that sense because I think a lot of this, and, and this is just me surmising this, a lot of that somewhatness, a lot of that slightliness comes from internal. I don't know that it shows up externally for them, right? Uh, the folks that we're going to talk about here at the, you know, as we can, uh, finish up this episode, they were people who were kind of succeeding in life, but they weren't significanting in life, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that's such a good way of describing it. I feel like uh, this is living life in, in the gray. Maybe if it's the Wizard of Oz, you know, you're in the black and white, you're not really in the technicolor, you know. Um, so there's just this, um, maybe there's not this uh, forest fire of anger and rage, but there's maybe a sort of smoldering discontent or the sort of embers of frustration that may not be obvious to people, but you might know it and over time those embers can actually get worse. So in, in a way, this is sort of a sad profile because there may be some residual anger, some frustration. Is this all there is? But hey, this is the only life I've known. This is the track I'm on. And, you know, as I sometimes say, a former Prime Minister in Australia, Malcolm Fraser, in a moment of uh, madness before an election, said, well, life wasn't meant to be easy. Uh, somehow we got elected, you know, uh, go figure. But, um, you know, these people might be thinking that life's not meant to be easy. Life's not meant to be fun. Life's about a paycheck and paying the rent and the mortgage. And that's just what life's about. It's not, I'm not meant to enjoy life. I'm not meant to have a technical life. But that kind of makes sense, Cheryl, is that kind of the image you have when you think of this poor person on a different track? I think that's a great characterization, Warwick. Um, living a lukewarm life, right? Um, you feel like it's gone along smoothly, really might not feel like you have nothing to complain about, but it hasn't really, but there is something missing, right? There might be a low-grade frustration or a low-grade depression, Um and it might feel like there's something that's left unsatisfied inside, right? Um, they might be holding on to a sadness or a discontent about a vision that's been left behind or a dream or a talent that was lost in the process of settling down, right? Um, or a passion you stopped pursuing. Gosh, I always love music, but once I got married and life got busy, I put the guitar down and I haven't picked it up in 10 years, but I still miss, right? I still miss that. It might be something like that, right? You know, life gets in the way. We all know what it looks like when life gets in the way. Or, you know, maybe I wanted to be a theater major, but I chose, you know, accounting because my parents thought I should do something practical or whatever that could look like, right? And um, um, so it's really interesting. One of the things that's very interesting about that is I went back to the research, to our researchers, David and Heather, who joined us on our first call. And I said, hmm, and Warwick had asked me a good question. He goes, well, what about if all the 28% of people who say they haven't had a crucible 
they're all in this category. What about all the people who say they haven't had a crucible who aren't feeling like they're living a lukewarm life, who answer these questions and say, no, life is great and life is awesome. And, and I know exactly where I'm going and I know exactly how to get there. And we went back and we looked at the regression analysis and we looked at all the data and we said, they don't exist. They don't <laughs> exist. Well, so what does that mean, right? Well, it actually means that we actually have all had crucibles. And this is a group of people, we've all had things in our lives that have fundamentally tra traumas or losses or failures or whatever that looks like that have fundamentally changed the trajectory of our life. None of us get off scot-free. There's always some boulder that gets in the way, right? That means you have to swerve around it and life changes track. And that could be small, that could be, I didn't make the basketball team in high school and I was passionate about basketball and that really felt like a meaningful change for me, or it could be any number of things. It doesn't have to be a death or a terrible failure. It could be feel smaller. It could feel not quite like a crucible, but we actually realize that everybody has those. When you're not, they're not recognized, we call them veiled crucibles, unacknowledged crucibles right? Um, there's significant points of trajectory shift. We all have them. None of us get away with not having them. That if we've left unresolved or unreconciled, right? And that sense of loss, it might not feel like you're giving up much early on when it happens. Like, oh, I put down the guitar and I just haven't picked it up for a decade, right? Or whatever that looks like. Um, or the paintbrush or I chose a different major than the one I was really passionate about, or, you know, the one who got away, who I really wanted to marry, but something happened. Um, that sense of loss can grow over time and can really fester and leave that sort of unfulfilled hole that can grow over time. It's almost like we've, Sometimes you might feel like nothing really bad ever happened to you, but you've left almost a part of you behind. And this crucible could take the form of a kind of sacrifice, right? One that you're willing to make, but it leaves something, a part of you behind, or it leaves a hole unfulfilled. And I think that's a lot of what these people, people who get this profile might be going through. I mean, you've described a lot of interesting feelings that this person uh, in this profile might be feeling. It's sort of a low-grade depression, sadness, this lukewarm life. There's, there's a dream that maybe they had when they were a kid or teenager that they left behind. As you said, very often our parents will say, be practical, which there's nothing wrong with being practical, but can't you be practical and enjoy life too? And call me an optimist, but I like to think it's possible to do both. But and there's that sense of when you've left that thing behind, I almost feel like over time, it doesn't get better. It gets maybe worse. And we've used this analogy about like the lobster boiling. You know, you might not realize the temperature is hot. What you also might not realize, it could be getting slightly hotter. But I think you might not even know what that pining is, right? You might know, you might even not know that it was like, it's about a specific thing. It may just feel like you're living a little bit of a dimmed version of yourself, right? You might not, it might be clear, gosh, I, I gave that up and I'm really missing it. Or it might not be. You might say, gosh, it just, it might be that, is this all there is question. And that could be a haunting question as you go through life to be thinking, is this all there is? I don't know. It just feels like almost a somewhat of a soul crushing question. Is this all there is? You're having that long walk through the woods and it's like, is this what life's about? Really? This is it? And it can even emanate uh, from quote unquote success in the world's eyes. I mean, that phrase, Warwick, is this all there is? I brought that to the table based on an experience I had 
with um, with someone I knew in the, in the late nineties when I lived Cheryl in in Palm Springs, California. Um, and, uh, his name was Albie Pearson and Albie had been a major league baseball player for the California Angels and the Washington Senators. In fact, he was the 1958 American League Rookie of the Year. So he had great success. Um, uh, but he told a story to me, um, about, uh, because he was a, he, he was, uh, I, I call him my spiritual grandfather. He was a, he was a strong Christian. Um, uh, and when he hit a home run, he was rounding the bases and he felt the, like God was speaking to him in, in, in a sense and, and saying to him, he could hear us. He could hear the song. Is this all there is in his head? He could hear those words in his head. He just hit a home run that won the game. And that's where his mind goes. Is this all there is? Um, uh, so successful in the eyes of the world, certainly successful by any of the, of the measures that we look at in sports, former American league rookie of the year, but he was, there's got to be more than this. And he pursued more than that. He, he, from his perspective, he then became a pastor. And, and, and for him, that was, um, uh, there's more than that. There, it, it wasn't all there was for Albie Pearson, which was, I thought, um, a, a great point to remember that, that it can look like things are going great. And it's internally where that, that roiling happens. I think one of the things you've landed on is the is the gap between success and significance right and i think you're absolutely right often when people reach a pinnacle that actually awakens this is this all there is feeling right because people get right you get you get what you think is the goal and you're like but i'm still not happy right i'm still right. not and you know i'm still not happy or i'm still not fulfilled i think you might have sort of I think that's a great articulation of the difference between success and significance. And I think that can feel really alone because other people see you and you seem successful and, you know, and all of those things, but yet yeah, you've got this hole inside. You know, hearing this discussion, some folks in this profile might be a little downcast, might be saying, gosh, you know, I don't know how great I felt before about being on a different track, but now I actually feel worse. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, Cheryl, Gary, and Warwick. Uh, it's very helpful here. Talk about how, while it may not feel great, um, that there may be some things that uh, are helpful, and maybe they're thinking, well, how do I get back on track? You know, how do I get how do I get out of this profile? <laughs> you know, basically to hitting your stride, right? Well, as yeah. we like to say here on Beyond the Crucible, knowledge is power. This is a great moment of self-reflection um, to really acknowledge that you have had crucibles in your life, that there have been moments they might. This is where we also like to say there is no comparing, right? There's no, but so-and-so has had it so much worse than me. I have no right to say I've had a crucible, right? It doesn't matter, right? To look at your life and say, okay, where have things taken a turn that uh, and to acknowledge what you've been through and um, process through that, embrace those moments for what they have been. Sometimes we leave those things in the in the face of stoicism or just getting through, or I, I've had it so much better than everybody else. We just sort of move on, look back, see what's really happened in our lives and what we might have left behind. Um, I think that moment of self-reflection can be really exciting and really powerful. Um, it's an opportunity to reflect, to really recognize um, what you have left, what you might have left behind or what's used to it, light your flame, that you'd like to have that flame lit again to resurrect the seeds of some long lost vision or dream or talent and craft a plan to get back on the right track, to hone that vision for today and make that dream a reality. Or maybe, it, cause it could be even nascent, right? It could be, I've always felt like I've had a creative side I haven't tapped into, or I've always had an entrepreneurial side I haven't really explored. And I've sort of left this part of me untapped. How exciting is it to be at a moment 
where you can actually start to see those things about you, what gifts and what skills and what talents you have, how you're, how you're designed that you may have left untapped. I think this can be a really exciting profile. And it's important to understand that you don't have to blow up your life to explore that. You can make small changes and take small steps to explore new avenues and cast a new goal for yourself. Yeah, it's such a good point. Um, I feel like in this profile, life is about choices and decisions. And when you feel like this low-grade depression, low-grade frustration, is this all there is? And you know, I can't really get off the track because I'm successful or this is just the life I've known. And, you know, I guess the choice to to start reflecting, that's really the first step is, well, let me think about it. You know, what did I want to do when I was younger or why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? Let me get in touch with maybe I'm more frustrated than I realize about my job. You know, maybe I think it's one out of 10. Maybe it's more like seven out of 10. I just... I want to admit to myself. So I think just making that decision to reflect, to thinking about small steps, um, you know, that's, that's so important. I think sometimes we stop and we have to reprogram ourselves to think, well, life just is what it is to know we're the architects of our own lives and we get to make choices. And if something isn't exactly like we want it to be, is there something we can do about it? And a lot of times we can, you know, we can make small changes that have big impact on how fulfilled we feel, what difference we're making in the world, what difference we're making on others around us, what brings us joy versus what is just meh, right? Nobody wants to live a meh life, but so many of <laughs> us just stay there. I've got a story. Um... And I've been waiting to tell it. I hadn't thought about it again with all the prep that we've done. And when Cheryl 10, 15 minutes ago said something about it, it was, it was, it was a drive by comment. Maybe music was your first love when you were younger. Um, and I'm, um, and I'm getting emotional about this because that was my mom's love. My mom loved to sing when she was, um, she was a, a, a girl and she was a young adult. And when she got married uh, to my dad, my my dad wasn't thrilled about that. So my mom, you know, kind of stuffed that down for decades. Um, my parents got divorced. Um, my mom met um, a man who uh, was locally here where I live in Wisconsin. He was he was an organist who played you know, like an electric organ, and and he was he he was incredibly popular in the area. But he always just played. The, he didn't sing. He just played the organ and. After they got married, my mom began to sing with him. And um, I got a picture here that I want to show uh, everybody so you can just see this. Uh, this is my mother holding the microphone here, if you can see that. That's my mom holding the microphone. They would play senior citizen centers. And uh, you can just see that the, the look of joy on the faces of the people that my mom is holding that microphone for. Um, and the hope that comes from that can go generations. When I got married to my wife, Kelly, um, seven years uh, ago, we were picking songs to sing. And I, I, I don't have any children quote unquote, of my own, but Kelly has two. Um, and when it came time to do the the daddy daughter dance, I danced with my stepdaughter, Alyssa, to a song that my mom sang, because I still have um, some of those recordings. And it was everything. That hope, that hope didn't, I mean, it's still going on. That hope is the hope that my mom found in turning into what was her life of significance and the way that she then blessed people like that, that elderly woman that I showed the picture of, um, it blessed me, uh, you know, 30 years after she passed away. Cause I got to play that song and dance with my girl, my stepdaughter at our, at, at, at my wedding to her mother. And that was, um, that's the power of, uh, of, of grabbing hold of those visions that maybe have passed us that you, that you've let, 
atrophy or you haven't been able to, to uh, pursue. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that story. I love that story, Gary. That's such a, you know, I've talked about, you know, my husband who always was very much into, he loved comedy and he loved music and he loved performing. Right. And, um, but he gave that all up. He got married and he had children and, you know, worked and all of those things. And he always thought that that was kind of behind him. And then once we got married and we moved here to Palm Springs and he was sort of looking for how to move forward and he got the opportunity to be an architectural tour guide. And he realized that, you know, doing that work was um, tap. And previously had never had a super satisfying career. He would had, had some success doing a few things and had changed tracks a couple of times. But when he got here and he got the opportunity to be an architectural tour guide and he realized not only was it education, which was something else he was passionate about, but it was actually entertaining and hosting crowds and yeah, keeping people engaged and happy and learning. And, you know, and he's like, wow, I didn't realize I could tap back all, into all those things that I love that I thought were part of my past, but now I can make my job. And nothing makes him happier when people say, last week, somebody, a guy said he got off a tour, he said, I'm usually bored on these things, but you kept me entertained the whole time. <laughs> and it, you know, he lit up like a Christmas tree. He was so happy. <laughs> and that's a great example of he could have never said he had he knew what he had felt like he had left behind, but he could never have said, oh, I'll just be a tour guide in my future life. It would have never occurred to him, but he sort of stumbled into that opportunity and he realized, wait, this is what I've been searching for and this is what I love. And it's so exciting to see him step into his full gifting in that way. Well, it's such great stories, uh, Cheryl and Gary, about, you know, Tony and finding an outlet for uh, comedy and theater in a way and being a tour guide. And yeah, it's not something you would think of, but he was open to the possibilities. And Gary, I mean, that's such a moving story of your mom. I mean, it's easy to think, well, life's too late. You know, I got married, had kids, got responsibilities. I can never have an outlet for music. But just out of curiosity, when she married your stepdad and started exploring music with him, uh, you know, him playing the electric organ and a you know senior centers and all, how old was she at that point in life? She was in her. She, started? Yeah, she was in her fifties, mid to late fifties. Yeah, she was in her fifties. So a lot of people at that point would say it's too late. I mean, who am I to start singing? I mean, the music is different. Maybe people will laugh at me or whatever. I'll make a fool of myself, uh, my family and friends. But I think what your mom's story shows is it's never too late. And I'm sure she was using her gift of music and singing to help other people to live a life of significance. I'm sure it gave her immense joy as she was helping others, I'm sure. Not only did they, you know, light up, I'm sure her countenance lit up and she was probably smiling and felt joyful, right? I'm sure you probably remember stories of when she came back and telling you how fun it was. That picture I showed on the YouTube version of the show um, is one of my favorite pictures of her because she's just so giddy. She looks, you know, she, she looks like a little girl. <laughs> she's so happy. So, yes, uh, it, it's, it's, it, is, it is never too late. And speaking of that, Warwick... It's never too late. Um, good segue. We just built the segue right into the show. Warwick, once again, we, um, uh, one, of, one of the great things, and, and it, it, this accentuates the point that as you're moving through from your trials to your triumphs, there are different marks on the map. There are different spots on the map, and you can pass through all many of them, if not all of them. So far, Warwick, you've passed through every profile we've gone through. And I know, but, but I mean, that's, and I say that to say, folks, that's the, that's the, the, the brilliance, uh, the, 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 the hope out of this model is that you're not stuck in one profile forever. You can move through it even before you get to the, the to the end goal that we've talked about hitting your stride. So Warwick, um, there was indeed a on a different track moment for you. Share it with folks. So 
I guess I grew up on a different track. Mm. <laughs> that was my life. <laughs> so as listeners uh, would probably know, I grew up in this 150-year-old family media business. And uh, I was on the track of duty and obligation. It was founded by my great-great-grandfather, John Fairfax, a man of great faith who uh, was beloved by his employees, wife, uh, children, fr friends. It was an incredible legacy. And so feeling like, how could you not want to be a part of a newspaper and media organization with some of the main mastheads and uh, properties in the Australian media, uh, making a difference in the nation of Australia? How could you not want to be part of that? How could you not want to help promote the legacy of this great person, your great-great-grandfather was like, well, that's a pretty incredible vision. And so, of course, I did. But, you know, I felt like my life was one of duty. I felt like I had no choice. Um, so in that sense, you know, in one sense, it was always challenging. There was always this crucible environment. I wouldn't have used that word, but the pressure to, you know, live up to the... Um, almost unspoken expectation. Sometimes when you've got parents and you have to do it or you're a loser, that's one thing to fight against. But when it's like, especially with my father who was in the family business, when there was just this unspoken expectation, it was never said, well, of course you should do this. It was just, well, when you come to the Herald or when you do this or when you do that, it was just this, which almost made it worse. How can you fight against something that's just this soft, unspoken expectation from a man that you dearly love and admire. I mean, it was getting out was, I, I, I didn't want to let him down. And so really, um, it, you know, life was what it was. It was always going to be challenging. There'd been divisions within the family going back decades before I was around, which is normal, unfortunately, in family businesses. So I always knew that there was going to be pressure. I always knew I was going to be under a microscope. Right. So as listeners probably know by now, I did my undergrad at Oxford, worked on Wall Street, went to Harvard Business School. It was all about this being on this different track, not only just living somebody else's life. I mean, I wasn't even living my dad's life. He was probably on a different track. He would have been a better philosophy professor. He wasn't really a great business person, truth be told. Um, so yeah, there's probably, I can't, you know, speak for my grandfather or beyond because I, I never met them, but um, uh, they were long since gone. But I don't know. Maybe there was a couple early generations that felt like they made a choice, but there could have been generations of family members on a different track. Certainly my father and I, definitely, from my perspective. And so, you know, my father's uh, great crucible was 11 years before my takeover and uh, my $2.25 billion takeover. And uh, 1987, which, you know, listeners can listen to other podcasts more on that story or read my book, Crucible Leadership, Embrace Your Trust, Lead a Life of Significance. And you'll hear, hear about it all. But in 1976, some other family members shoot my dad out, which was a crucible for him. But for me, it just turned up the heat uh, of the boiling water because that meant I'm the next rung up, if you will. Um, I'm the next person that's going to have to... Uh, take over my father's mantle now that he's being thrown out as chairman. So I don't know that I viewed it as a crucible, but the pressure and the intensity, it increased at that point. But um, it really, rather than make me feel like, gee, should I do something else? It basically cemented the fact that I need to go on this track, I need to go on this trajectory. It just made it ever more necessary in my mind that what I want to do in life, what I enjoy, is an irrelevant, almost selfish question. You don't ask yourself, what do you want to do in life? That's Life's not about me. It's about preserving the dynasty and preserving this incredible vision that's here to help the nation of Australia. Again, I, I can't tell you both how much I love these moments because I never think about them. With all the work that we've done here for the last four, almost five years, and it's like fresh insight, right? Um, you didn't feel, I, I wrote this down, you didn't feel like you had a crucible, right? You didn't feel like in what you just described, you had a crucible until your crucible of losing the family company happened, which made you realize you did have 
you, you had had a crucible. So you didn't, you didn't think you had a crucible when you were younger. You had a crucible from the takeover that made you realize that you had a crucible when you were younger. And that's a pretty common, Cheryl, I'll ask you this question. That's a pretty common thing that happens to people as they go through this profile, right? You don't think you have a crucible, then you have a crucible, you learn lessons of that, and then you, you move beyond it. So, I mean, that's a fair assessment of what Warwick's been through, I think. Absolutely. I mean, I think when we talked about this earlier, the idea that if I, I think I asked you, Warwick, Warwick, you would have, would you have ever said that that was, those were crucible moments when you, you know, you would have said, no, I would have thought I lived right. a crucible free life. <laughs> and I think once you have a crucible and you start to reflect back and you think you look at, you, you know, crucible moments are natural reflection times. And when you start to look back at your life and you can start to unpack what's happened before, you can start to, recognize that life wasn't so crucible free, right? That there are actually like work you never even thought had thought you had the right to think about, gee, I'd rather be a fireman instead. That wasn't even an option, right? <laughs> right. No, exactly. I mean, I thought that occurs to me is if you're, you know, let's use the analogy we've used before, like a lobster boiling in water, you could say, are you in a crucible? No, because all that life is, is being in a pot of boiling water. It's only when you realize there's actually a life outside of this pot. There's actually a good life. Huh. Now that I know there's a good life, actually, I guess I've been living a crucible my whole life in one sense, but I didn't realize it. You know, it's this life seemed to be fine, but it's, it's when that's all you know, you don't even have the ability to realize it's a crucible in the first place, if that makes sense. At least that was kind of my story. I mean, it's like, well, is, this is my duty. This is my life. And uh, it, it, asking me, is this a crucible? It's like, it, it's about as relevant as asking, what do you want to do in life? It's, what do I do with that question? It's not going to change anything. It's, it's, a not, it's not a helpful question. So um, until you understand that there is a different, better life, you can't even recognize you're in the pot of boiling water and it's a crucible in the first place. Does that make some degree of sense? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and the you've just built a perfect on-ramp to how you answer the question I'm going to ask you now, which is how did you get beyond your uh, your moment of being on a different track? And you've just, I mean, we've, I'm sorry, I sort of <laughs> stole your thunder when I said no. your crucible T taught you right. that that was the case, but it, unpack that a little bit more for folks. Absolutely, Gary. So for me to get off this different track, life had to get exponentially worse. You know, the, the boiling water had to be turned to, I don't know, lava setting, basically. It had to get really, really bad. And I actually had to hit not like this low grade, boy, you know, is this, I don't even know if I asked, is this all there is? It's just yeah, life had to get worse. And so after I launched my $2.25 billion takeover in uh, 1987, you know, ostensibly after my dad died early that year to bring the company back to the vision of the founder, have it be well managed, which again, more details of that in the book and other podcasts. Uh, after three years of numerous refinancing, uh, it failed. But that whole time, uh, if you better believe, uh, the, the worst moments were once the takeover had quote unquote succeeded and we were able to take control of the company in late 1987. You know, up until then, it was like, look, this is, we just got to close the deal. At that point, as I'm in the elevator and I've described this elsewhere and I'm feeling so uncomfortable talking to other people because here I am like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 26, 27. Then I began thinking, go, this is not fun. <laughs> You know, I'm not cut out to be this media mogul. I am not enjoying this. I'm still thinking like there is no choice. We've got to keep pressing forward because, but I'm beginning to think, gosh, why am I here? I don't want to be here. You know, before then it was like, well, it's my duty. The feelings of I don't want to be here. This is not fun. That, that I, it was harder to ignore. That certainly came more to the fore, uh, to the front of my mind. So basically, you know, the pit had to get a lot worse. And ultimately, how I got off a different track was when the company ultimately had to file for bankruptcy in late uh, 1990. 
At that point, that track was over. The track was ripped away from me, not by my choice. I didn't make a choice to leave the track. It was ripped away from me, that ripped out of my heart and soul, if you will. So at that point, I'm a reflective person by nature, very reflective, which is kind of ironic. But uh, you know, why reflect when there's no, you have a duty to stay on the track. But at that point, it's like, well, where do I go from here? And it took me years to sort of figure that out and forgive myself, my own failures, maybe forgive in some sense the conflicts that existed before I was born. I had to do a lot of reflection. It took a long time. But gradually, I came to realize I do have a choice. It is okay to pursue things that I'm good at and that I feel like I'm called to. I began to find my own life of significance because I was living my whole life. I was living somebody else's life of significance, my great-great-grandfather's life of significance. It was a wonderful life. It was a wonderful vision. It was dedicated to helping others. It was a life on purpose, but it wasn't my vision. So it's great to live a life of significance, but live your own life of significance, not somebody else's. Because that's, cause, you know, that's not helpful. Uh, and so, yeah, it took that crushing loss of the family media business to enable me to get off that track. Without that $2.25 billion ta- takeover, I can't imagine that I ever would have left that track. I, I would have felt like I was letting down my dad and my great-great-grandfather. I mean, it was, it basically, I had to be, you know, that track had to be ripped away from me for me to get out. You know, I think what strikes me is, Warwick, you were on a different track, but you didn't recognize those crucibles. You didn't recognize, you said it so well, it had to be ripped away from you. You had to experience another crucible in order to, that sense of duty was so strong and obligation and commitment was so strong that you didn't self-reflect. You know, I think this is the, this is the gift of, Earlier, you asked me, um, well, somebody might be downcast if they got this result. But, you know, imagine if it may not have changed anything, but you might have, imagine if, fast, you know, go backwards and imagine this existed and you took a moment and you realized, you know, you got this result. It may have at least pa- paused you to say, gee, are there things that I'm doing that I'm not quite so gifted at? Or is there something that is unfulfilled? Or, you know, I think those moments of reflection, even when they're painful, can be such great gifts. Because as you said, it might not happen for everybody. Some people might live a lukewarm life their whole lives. We all know people who do that. But it also can lead to this path of, well, it's gonna happen to you if you don't do something about it. You're gonna, you're gonna hit the big crucible. Well, let's start talking about um, our podcast guests who um, who uh, went through when we uh, talked to them. They had very strong on a different track moments. The first one we'll talk about is Nancy Volpe Beringer. Um, as a young girl, she loved to sew much like my mother loved to sing, right? But her parents encouraged her to pursue a more practical career path. So she did. She worked throughout her life and into her mid-50s to land that practical job. She finally got it in her 40s, a position of authority in a New Jersey teachers union. It was a well-paying job. I'll never forget her words, the kind you retire from, she said. But she wasn't happy. Uh, in her words, she said this, so I achieved what I, I achieved what I thought was my dream job and became a director of the group that I used to work in. It was almost immediate. I thought I could make a difference and it wasn't happening. There was just so many roadblocks. So not only was I having trouble breathing because my creativity was being stalled, it also, also my effectiveness was being stalled. Her creative itch wasn't being scratched, Warwick. That's where she found herself in her on a different track moment. How did she get, um, so what were some more beats of that on a different track moment for Nancy Volpe Berenger? You know, it's sort of interesting. She'd always been a creative soul, but um, like so many people, I guess you want to be practical. And uh, she worked hard and um, a bit like some of the other folks we're going to touch on, her challenge was that she was, very good at what she did. And she, you know, achieved a 
high position in the New Jersey Teachers Union and making a difference for the members there. Um, and yeah, as you said, she was getting paid well, a job to retire on, but she had the wisdom to start asking herself, is this all there is? She began uh, thinking there might be something I could do differently in life, her creative itch. It wasn't being scratched, and rather than suppressing it, she took note of that and had the courage to ask, start asking herself some very tough questions that, uh, frankly, not everybody, including her own family, supported. It wasn't like it was a universal group that said, yeah, Nancy, you're right. Yeah, mom. You know, it's like, it's tough to make a change when that's the only friend, mom, uh, relative that you know. And it's like, what? You know, so, but to her great credit, she began to ask herself some really tough questions. You know, what talents and interests do I have? Um, yeah, so it's just, a, it's a great story. And it's, it's interesting that you <clears throat> have used a couple of times the lobster boiling metaphor, because one of the things she told us when we interviewed her uh, for the podcast, when it got so bad or on a different track moment was just so, there was, there was something she had to do about it. She said this, uh, it was the vol it was like the volcano erupted and I started losing sleep. I just knew I was in a bad place. She got that self-awareness. Um, and, uh, that's when to overcome it, uh, she did something that everybody thought was crazy. Many people in her life thought was crazy. Um, she pursued her passion with vigor. In her own words, she said this. I'm going to read it verbatim. I dared to ask myself, if I was young again, what would I want to be learning? Hypothetical question. The amazing thing was the answer came immediately to me. Immediately. And it was fashion design. Don't ask me where it came from. It came immediately. So I'm not sleeping and I start researching programs and I'm going to see what schools, what's available. And then I see interior design and I'm like, well, maybe I should do that at my age. And then I went, no, Nancy, we're just dreaming. The practical is to stay where you're at. This isn't about being practical. This is about a fantasy. If you were young. Well, I started researching it. By the next week, I was in New York touring two of the top fashion schools. She ultimately got her, ma her master's degree from one of those fashion schools, Drexel University, and auditioned to appear on season 18 of TV's reality show Project Runway. She finished, she finished as runner-up. It was on the show she discovered her couture calling, designing accessible, adaptable clothing for those who haven't historically had access to high fashion. I know, Sherilyn Warwick, both of you have been uh, moved, were moved by Nancy's story. So whichever one of you wants to go first, talk a little bit about what that can teach, what Nancy can teach us about how um, we get beyond this profile. Gary, Nancy Volpe Berenger is just a, uh an incredible person that she's doing so well, uh, getting paid a lot in this uh, New Jersey teachers union. And she begins to ask questions that she could have taken a safer route and say, well, okay, at my age, you know, she was, I think in the late fifties or something at the time, maybe, you know, interior design would have been a safer choice. Uh, excuse me. Would have been a safer choice. Nothing wrong with interior design at all, but she said, no, no, Nancy, you know, we're just dreaming here. Let's not kind of uh, cut the vision in half for her because that was not what she was fe feeling called to. It was to fashion design. And that took immense courage. I'm sure her family was like, what? And then, you know, uh, when she's going to school, the people that she's in school with, the other students, they are decades younger than her. And can you imagine what she's thinking? Oh, they're probably kind of whispering behind my back. What's she doing here? You know, grandma. I mean, can you imagine? Some of them might have said things like that because people aren't always kind, unfortunately. And, you know, it, I mean, it would have taken immense courage. I can't imagine there were other people of her generation doing that. So it, it took immense courage. But this just goes to show you when you have a dream and a vision, you've got to pursue it. You know, you might not get supported. There may be people laughing at you, you know, fellow people at work or uh, in, in, you know, uh, in college, but she showed tremendous courage to pursue that. And what I love about her story is that sense of fearlessness, 
it went beyond just fashion. She, she had this sense, I don't know that she would have articulated at the time, that life is about significance. And as we spoke to her when she was on, uh, as you mentioned, season 18 of Project Runway, so one of the things that the, uh, the things they do on Project Runway is um, they give you different challenges. In this particular uh, case, it was to design fashion for people with physical challenges. And all the other people on that show were like, ah, oh, I don't want to do that. That's too difficult. Like, <laughs> right. not me. You know, right. sort of like any hands and everybody's hands go down and people's chins fall, eyes down. Not Nancy Volpe Barrett. She's just like, yes, I can help people. So it's a sense of courage, not just to do fashion, but to pursue something in fashion that's, that's not easy. You know, to make that work and make the person look and feel, you know, their best and beautiful and all. Um, she's like, I can do this. I'm willing to do, I'm willing to try. Just her level of courage to get from where she was on this safe track of being a, you know, a executive, if you will, on the teachers union to doing fashion, not just fashion, but doing fashion for people who have, you know, physical challenges and have, you know, differently abled. I mean, that's just incredible. Her courage of pursuing, she really got off that off a different track to her own track, and mm. I was, I was just—it's an incredible story of courage uh, and pursuit of her vision of what was on her heart. I I love her story, right? Because I think I think she was in her sixties or her early sixties when she went yeah, back to 60s, school. Yeah, sixties. Yep. Could you imagine the drive to be able to? say yes and step into a traditional fashion design program and to say it'd be so easy to say oh that's a game for young people and that's not that that's just passed me by to have the courage to say no now is my time and i'm gonna do that and and because the drive um is so strong that it overcomes the fear, right? Or the doubt. And I think that's super exciting. I think it just, it, and talk about, and she's had such success and to really be able to use that as a touchstone for it's never too late. We can always pursue what we're designed for. And when you're on the right track, I mean, she clearly knew it. She clearly knew this is what she was meant to do and because she stuck with it and you know her story is so inspiring i think it just blows my mind our next guest and it's he's in sort of the same place right a little later in life never too late and that's robert miller uh, he wanted to make music his career um, from the first time he picked up an instrument in high school but he did not get to fulfill that desire until after he retired his dreams were deferred by the usual beats of life, right? A successful career that took him in another direction, family joys and responsibilities. Um, but in his 60s, he grabbed his guitar and launched his band Project Grand Slam and finally felt the rush of playing original songs at festivals and concerts around the globe. His success in pursuing his lifelong passion also led him to create his top-rated podcast, Follow Your Dreams. This is what he said in his own words about his off the his his on a different track moments. He said this: I had this dream from an early age that I wanted to become a rock star. I wanted to play music with all the guys that I grew up with, and they were my heroes. So I did have this burning desire and it was always there and it wasn't, and I wasn't doing exactly what I wanted to do. And the question became, was there ever a time and a place and a method where I could start to gravitate towards that? And it took me a long time. The last thing he said here is, I was very frustrated, very conflicted because on the one hand, I had a life that was working for my family, but it wasn't satisfying the urge, the dream I had always had inside me. Warwick, this is also a story I know you've referred back to many times on the show, and it really uh, moved you uh, from Robert. So talk a little bit about your why that was so moving to you. Yeah, when I think of Robert Miller, he was trapped by his own success. He was good at writing. He became a top bankruptcy attorney. 
in New York. He was getting paid a lot, uh, rose up the, the ranks. And how do you get out of a job when you're supporting your family, you're giving your family a lifestyle that's, you know, very nice? Um, it's almost impossible to get out of it, not just because of the money, but, you know, you go to the country club or, you know, just different gatherings with other business folks or other lawyers. And you say you're going to do something else. It's like, what? I mean, they just think you're absolutely crazy. Everybody around you is going to say you're crazy. And so, you know, getting out of, um, it's one thing if your job is falling apart, you get fired and uh, that's a different scenario maybe. But when you're doing so well, um, it's just hard to get out. What makes his story so um, hard to hear in a way is that some people it's like, well, this is the only life I've lived. I don't know what else I'd do. That's not his story. He always knew he wanted to be a musician. His dad was a jazz musician. I think he played swing music in you know, his different generation. And so while that wasn't exactly uh, Robert's dream, he wanted to be, become a rock star. But how many kids have thought like, oh, yeah, I want to be like the Beatles and or whoever it is, Led Zeppelin. I mean, it's like the chances of that happening is like not high. It's like people that say, I want to be a movie star. Well, it's just, yeah, you know, chances are like slim. Doesn't mean you shouldn't pursue it, but, you know, it's it's not easy. So we always had this dream, but um, yet the decades went by and that dream was there, but he never did anything about it. I, I have to wonder if that simmering discontent probably got worse over the decades. I'm guessing it probably did. But what's amazing about his story is in his you know, late 50s, 60s, he got to a point where he made a choice. I want to pursue this dream. I want to try. And that was an incredible decision that I'm sure a lot of people would have said, Robert, you are crazy. It's not even a midlife crisis. It's like a right. <laughs> you know, uh, senior citizen crisis or whatever they would have said to him. It's like, what is your problem? You know? Um, enjoy the fruits of your labor, retire, you know, you've earned, you've earned a, a time of rest. You've earned a time to just relax, play golf. You know, what's, what's up with this whole music business? I mean, that's just, that's crazy. I thought you were smarter than this. I can, I can't imagine what people would have said to him. I'm sure some of it would not have been, uh, helpful, put it that way. No. And, you know, returning to the theme that we talked about earlier, right? The, to to the outside world, this can look like great success. It looked like great success for Robert because he was a successful, a very successful bankruptcy attorney in New York City. I mean, he was doing well, um, but that did not get away from this gnawing sense of, is this all there is? And I love, he said some great things. I'm just going to read a couple of them about how he overcame this on a different track moment. He said, what started him down the path was, and finally got him to where he wanted to go, he discovered by accident. I was living in New York City, and there was a place here at the time, I'll call it a musician's dating service. <laughs> it wasn't actually a dating service, but you went down to this place and told them, this is the kind of music I want to play. So if he said Led Zeppelin album two, side one, they'd find three other idiots that wanted to play that music with you. And that's what I did. <laughs> Just fascinating stuff, right? Um, he also said this, uh, the first thing he did after that, he sat down and said, what do I need to do? And I'm a great believer in baby steps, okay? Because I said, from a standing start, I want to, sorry, if... Because if I said from a standing start, I want to be playing Madison Square Garden next year, that's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. But if I was able to write down the first five or six steps on a napkin that I needed to do, I knew I needed to form a band. I needed to write some music again. I needed to start rehearsing with the band. I needed to get gigs with the band, things like that. That, Warwick, I mean... And Cheryl, baby steps. I mean, we say that uh, on this show, you know, pretty much every third episode. So that is is some real stark, really inspiring, I think, um, things he did to move beyond his on a different track moment, right? Yeah, I think, Gary, his concept of baby steps and how he lived that out is one of the most powerful examples we may have ever had on the podcast of how to do it and do it the right way. 
He didn't say, yep, you know, I've got some money, you know, let's go, um, you know, Madison Square Garden would be one thing. But he could have picked some arena and I'm going to do something uh, grand. Now, he was smart that he said, well, okay, I've heard about this place where, as you say, it's like a musician's dating service and I can hang out and play with a few folks. And then later on, he sort of advertised on uh, Craigslist for a band. He just did it step by step by step, probably playing in smaller you know, uh, arena, not even arenas, but just small, uh, uh, just thank you. <laughs> thank you. He was playing in smaller clubs, uh, just step by step. Uh, and gradually one step fed on another. And he was able to launch Project Grand Slam, which is, uh, from this perspective, it's a combination jazz, rock, fusion. But he did it step by step, and now it's very successful. Yeah, and now he has his own podcast, Follow Your Dream. Uh, his story is a great example that when you're changing from a lifelong career, take it one baby step at a time. Just see if you even like it, if this kind of resonates, and then trust yourself, trust the process. It's such a great example of how to do it right. I love what you just said, Warwick, about right, those small steps and how they build. We've talked in the past about this flywheel that starts to move. Where he has ended up is not where he could have imagined when he first went out on Craigslist, right? But the flywheel starts going. Sometimes those first steps, making the decision to do something and taking those first steps are the biggest thing you can do, right? Sometimes people will say the first decision is 80% of the effort because that's when the engine starts moving. And look where it's led him that he couldn't have even imagined, but it uh, it's getting that flywheel moving and doing something is so impactful. For sure. Speaking of getting the flywheel moving, we'll move on to our third guest uh, that we spoke to, and that's Chris Shembra, who uh, also uh, had a very moving and meaningful um, on a different track moment. He returned home from New York City in 2015, so this is not that long ago, after producing a successful Broadway show in Italy, only to find himself feeling insecure, lonely, disconnected, and unfulfilled. All his words. His antidote, food and friendship. What began as a single as a simple gathering of a few friends to eat and share stories once a week became the 747 Gratitude Experience, named after the start of the uh, the start time of each dinner, which has sparked, listen to this number, folks. More than 500,000 relationships and help some of the nation's top companies create cultures of gratitude among their teams. Um, the, uh, in his own words, uh, what led him to get on this on a different track, though, was he got back to New York City after Italy and it threw him for a loop that he wasn't expecting. I was miserable, he said, overwhelmed, insecure, cautious, anxious. I just, I just broken up with a girlfriend. I was lonely. His words, I was lonely as frick is what he said. First time I think we've said frick in this context on the show. Uh, but then Tony Lobianco, who was, uh, an actor you may have heard of folks, uh, who was also his best friend and production partner. He got married. Um, uh, and he was sitting there. Chris Shembra was, and he was like, what do I do now? How do I recreate the magic that I felt over in Italy? And he asked himself this question, what was it about Italy? And he came to this conclusion. It was La Dolce Vita. Was it how they walked, how they talked, how they dressed, how they honored history, how they loved art? Nope, none of those things. This is what it was. It was how they ate food. Specifically, it's how they ate food amongst community. Or if that was another uh, episode that was um, really impactful that, that this idea, I've heard you say it many times since then, this idea of La Dolce Vita, this thing he didn't know. He didn't know he was going through a crucible. He just knew he wasn't feeling fulfilled. He was feeling a little unsure of what his next steps were. But then he he dug in and found this idea of, of what could be the seeds of a vision, right? Absolutely, Gary. Uh, I mean, he was on a successful career track in you know, Broadway shows and he was doing them in Italy and, um, you know, doing things with his friend, uh, an actor, Tony Lobianco, and um, life was going, life was going well, but coming back to the U.S. from Italy almost triggered a crucible in a way. It triggered a, is this all there is moment, which I don't think he really thought about. 
um, I don't think he realized what was happening in Italy, that he was getting exposed to another vision, but I don't think that really occurred to him. It was happening subconsciously. He was realizing that maybe he was on this Broadway treadmill, but uh, there was something about the Italian culture, this phrase, la dolce vita, that means the sweet life or the good life. Uh, it's symbolized, and there was a lot of um, 1960s Italian movies that came out that sort of symbolized uh, this sort of way of thinking. And he loved this idea of food and community. It's almost like haunted him in the good sense of that word. And he began to think, well, how can I make this happen here in the U.S.? It really, it really triggered him. That phrase, that concept of La Dolce Vita, that was really the turning point that enabled him to shift. And the creation of the 747 Gratitude Experience, very interesting. We've talked about the antidote to this feeling of on a different track, is this all there is, is finding that life of significance. And, and here's the life of significance that he's created here. Um, at every one of the dinners that they have at the 747 Gratitude Experience, they ask this question, only one question for everybody who comes to attend. If you could give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, who would it be? Lots of great conversations have come out of that. And <clears throat> so much so that they have research is, it, that the 747 Gratitude Experience is the only evidence-based proven framework that has a 99.8% guaranteed positional, sorry, that has a 99.8% guaranteed positive emotional transformation within a 90-minute virtual experience. That is I mean, we talk about being off the charts passionate. That's off the charts significant, isn't it, Warwick? It really is. I mean, Chris Chambra is living his life of significance. He created his own uh, pasta sauce, and um, you Which know, you got. Good. I had some. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so he's having this wonderful. He's creating this wonderful environment of good food and a good camaraderie, good community. A good community. And what they're doing is they're having fun, but real conversations to ask, you know, um, who's one person you give credit to, you may not have given credit to. Sometimes people will say, well, there was this teacher in school that was my nemesis that made life so difficult and said, oh, you could never be a biologist or a scientist or whatever. And the person came, you know, uh, ended up being a scientist. And it's like, well, that person really helped change my life. Even though, even though they were very negative, I felt like I'm going to show him. I'm going to show, I'm going to make it. So sometimes not only are you grateful for the positive experiences, sometimes those negative experiences that can be a real gift. And so the stories can be really interesting. They could be very unexpected. So as you can imagine, um, Chris is sitting down with these folks and he's having an enormous impact on their lives because of just the camaraderie, the community, and the food, and the sense of real conversation, hearing other people's stories, learning from them, hearing what people are, grat are grateful for. So you're right. I'm sure he is off the charts passionate. This is a very unique vision that just came from being in Italy, this La Dolce Vita concept. It's a, it's a great story. Sometimes the solution to getting off this track can and come in the most unexpected ways. But he was smart enough to realize and says, you know what? I'm going to do something with this. I'm going to figure out how I translate that back into the U.S. So I can create these time of incredible community amidst great food and uh, the essence of La Dolce Vita. It was such a great story. And it's a great example of birthing something that you couldn't have imagined on paper, like you couldn't have sketched it out on paper. You can't, you couldn't have said, I'm going to create a business that does this, right? <laughs> and, but exactly. yet talk about an intersection of passions and intersection of, of drive and a will and a desire to have an impact and bring something to people that they otherwise would not experience. And I, I think, I think it's such a great story of where, you know, one of the things that strikes me about all these stories is this idea of where your passions can lead you 
just by taking steps that you just can't imagine at the front end of the of the journey but it's so exciting you know it's uh i think that's so exciting of what can be ahead of you if you just take the steps again we've covered a lot of ground um as we always do is the way it always works out we come up with things i'm i'm like getting teary eyed talking about my mom. I, who I hadn't thought about that in forever. So, um, this, this is good for us. I, I'll say it again, folks, uh, who are watching and, and listening when the, when the folks who are, who are giving you the content are themselves being moved by it, uh, are, are, are realizing new things about it. That's a pretty good sign that what you're hearing hopefully is, is, is quite valuable to you. Um, in that, um, in that vein, Warwick, any final thoughts that you want to leave our listeners and viewers with as we as we wrap this uh, this episode of this series? You know, being on a different track, it can be soul destroying in the slow burn way. It can be this simmering discontent, simmering frustration. Is this all there is? But you feel like this is the only life I've known. Certainly in my case, I felt like there was no other life I could live without letting down my family. Everybody's story can be a little different, even within this profile of on a different track. But when you think about it, I think what can be common to many in this profile is that sense of, is this all there is? It can get worse as the decades go by. Mm -hmm. And it's never too late, but it's also never too early. You know, the time to change is now, not in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Uh, life can be better. It doesn't have to be this gray, hey, I, I live in a world of boiling water and that just is what it is. Life's not meant to be fun. It's not meant to be easy. And hey, you know, uh, it's I need to be practical and it's somehow selfish to live my own dreams, which is kind of what I thought. And other people might think, you know, it's selfish not to be practical. I've got people depending on me. I've got a paycheck to generate. So I'm not going to go off and be a painter or an artist. That's just... That's just crazy stuff. It's irresponsible. It's mm. not caring for others. You can, you can talk yourself into staying on this different track with all this unhelpful, negative, uh, soul crushing self talk, if you will. So I think it begins with making a choice. It's probably one of the words we use most often on mm. Beyond the Crucible is the word choice. Life is about choice. We are some of our decisions. It's making the choice. I think, as we've said, to reflect. Okay, what is it that, you know, I enjoy in life? Let's assume that I wasn't tied to a, a life of duty and obligation and responsibility. Uh, not that those words are all wrong, necessarily. But if I could do anything I wanted to, what would that be? Just giving yourself permission to ask the question. And then as Robert Miller so uh, well, so excellently showed us, thinking about what is the first baby step I could approach to living that different life. I may not know where it's going to head. I'm sure Chris Chamber may not have quite known what it was, but he just started right. trying something and then it just built. He didn't decide, yep, I have this vision of doing the 747 gratitude experience. And I'm confident that Google, Microsoft, Verizon, and the U.S. Navy are all, you know, sign up for this, which they have. <laughs> right. it, it wasn't like that. And neither was it with uh, Robert Mill. I'm going to be singing in these big arenas. I'm going to have this big impact and, you know, millions of people are going to, you know, download my music. No, it's just, let me go to, you know, Craigslist. Uh, I'm sure I believe with Chris Chambra, I'm going to have a dinner party. I'm going to have, I'm going to invite right. my friends up. I'm going to ask a question and we'll just see what happens. That was the first step. How hard is that? Inviting your friends over for dinner. I'm sure he cooks pretty well. It's not a hard, hard thing to do. People say, oh, Chris is having us to dinner. I like Chris. It'll be fun and we'll have great food. That's not a, that's not a big first right. step in a sense. So I think really the story with this uh, profile is it, it can be soul destroying staying on this different track as the decades go by. Make a choice to reflect on what is it you want out of life. Uh, rather than saying, is this all there is? Maybe you'll get to the point if you've often shared, uh, you know, Gary, is it's not, is all, this all there is? This is all I want. This is what I want right. in life. The, the change can happen, but it begins with reflecting and making that first small baby step. You can indeed get off this different track to the right track, to the track that makes your heart come alive. 
I say it every episode. I've been in the communications business long enough to know when the last word's been spoken on a subject. Warwick just spoke it. So, friends, if you want to join us on this journey, head over to beyondthecrucible.com and take the free self-assessment. You'll get your results right away, and you can discover where you are on the map now and how you get from where you're at now to your unique life of significance. So I'll say it again, go to beyondthecrucible.com and take the self-assessment. And be sure to join us next week as we start to explore the map. We're all on as we move from trials to triumphs. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week.